I'm Maria Lorena Lehman, founder of the Sensing Architecture Academy and author of Adaptive Sensory Environments. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate today. Right now, we're going to explore how adaptive sensory environments expand human potential. As you can see in this diagram, adaptive sensory environments are primarily made of two parts. The first part is sensory design, which is designed for how humans perceive and respond. The second part is adaptive design. This is the design of environments that change and adapt in real time. Together, these two parts work in design to form narratives, and these narratives work to expand and heighten human potential, which in turn brings great benefit for the natural environment. Now, adaptive sensory environments exist as real-time narrative fabrics between an occupant journey and the natural environment. You see, adaptive sensory environments work by creating new relationships between an occupant and their context. This allows occupants to see more deeply into their own motivations, inspirations, decision-making, and ultimate outcomes. The environment helps them to become more self-aware, which leads to more beneficial behaviors that ultimately heighten their own human potential. Now, as environments engage in this type of real-time narrative, they become tuned, which results in deeper, more personalized relationships with occupants. Again, this increases beneficial behaviors, which help both the individual and the collective. Also, this creates new kinds of harmonizations with nature, which increase well-being, beauty, and safety. Adaptive sensory environments work to meet not only short-term needs, but also longer-term goals. Adaptive sensory environments work by focusing on adaptive learning. You see, this is a closing of gaps. The environment actually helps occupants get from where they are now to where they want to be. So the environment and occupants work together. They change and grow, each benefiting from interaction with the other. In order for environments to engage in adaptive learning, it's important for designers to inject the five levels of experience into their design. These five levels are the physiological, the intellectual, the emotional, the behavioral, and the spiritual. An example of these all working within a design can be seen in the post-operative recovery room. Such a room that is designed as an adaptive sensory environment can work to help with patient symptoms, such as disorientation or vertigo, pain, uncertainty and anxiety, lack of motivation, and overwhelm. The narrative of such an environment can work by introducing a horizon line or introducing views of nature. The environment can help to guide patients and educate them. The environment can also help by fostering healthy lighting and sound and can introduce features for contemplation. Each of these can help to minimize and target patient symptoms as the design works in this real-time narrative. It's important to also note that this way of thinking about design extends into the public realm as buildings communicate with public spaces in renewed ways. For example, Nature, which is planted strategically, can both create healing gardens for the exterior while also providing those critical nature views, which according to Robert Sapolsky, reduce the amount of pain medication needed for hospital patients. Thus, the exterior public realm and the interior private realms are extensions of one another, particularly important to note as occupant narratives unfold. As you can imagine, as designs engage in these types of real-time narratives, they're becoming more complex. And as they become more complex, they're becoming more dynamic. For this reason, it is important for designers to see more deeply into their design earlier in the process. In order to do this, it's important for designers to better understand the impact quality of their design as it becomes more dynamic. 
You see, design features should be studied more deeply in terms of their timing and the action that they create. And by seeing more deeply in this way earlier in the design project, the better the outcome. Now, by designing for better impact quality, new innovations in architectural behavior will surface. And they'll surface at the urban scale, the social scale, and the green scale. At the urban scale, buildings will be able to coordinate with one another in new ways. At the social scale, buildings will be able to communicate with public spaces in new ways. And at the green scale, buildings will represent nature in ways that have never been experienced before. Next steps in the development and research of adaptive sensory environments include expanding the design vision. This means that one needs to expand their design mindset to innovate occupant experiences. Also, again, it's important to see more profoundly into the design process because this impacts the architectural behavioral quality. Also, it's important to innovate and invent new design tools that help with dissecting new kinds of concept designs that are multi-narratives. Such design tools can include gaming tools, which help to synchronize environmental stimuli, probability tools, which help to predict the best design intervention for occupant goal attainment, and assessment tools to help measure occupant impact and green impact. Now, occupants and environments will work together in a team-like teamwork fashion, where occupants participate in shaping the design narrative, which ultimately directly impacts their own outcomes. For example, experiencing nature in an urban context can do much for health, happiness, and socialization. But what if such a green space were presented through an interactive sensory plaza, such as the West Crescent Plaza, which was designed by Stanley Consultants? This plaza uses light, stone, plants, and moving water to tell the story of water in Colorado, here in the United States. As the plaza's water mimics the rippling waves of a stream in some areas and mimics a desert spring in others, it is designed in a way that is sensitive to the current drought situation. This plaza heightens citizen awareness by tapping into the five levels of experience, serving to trigger memory, emotion, and motivation. And to bring this idea into more adaptive realms, what if the story that the plaza tells is ever-changing as it syncs with the real-time water and other environmental needs of the community? In this way, it would become a city center that is a beacon to the community that more tangibly fosters green behaviors within more self-aware citizens. Again, this helps the individual and the collective to achieve their desired goals. You see, the adaptive sensory environment works by intervening at just the right moment to help occupants increase their human potential by helping them see more deeply, again, into their own motivations, inspirations, decision-making, and ultimate outcomes. In other words, the environment does not make decisions for occupants. Instead, it helps them get from where they are now to where they want to be. And this in turn will help increase beneficial behaviors, which help occupants help themselves, help each other, and help the greater global good. If you'd like to learn more about the development, research, and methodologies behind adaptive sensory environments, I invite you to read my book, Adaptive Sensory Environments, and visit my website at marialorenalieman.com. I'd like to thank you very much for watching.